Hello everyone and welcome to the next part of our Wednesday Bible study on Hebrews. Just as we gather together, let's pause and let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day and for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, as we come to study, we again remember um, our world and our country at this time with everything that's going on with COVID. We just pray for wisdom for our leaders. And Lord, pray that we, the, the members of this world, the people um, would be responsible as well, uh, that we would act out of love to one another. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that through it, you teach us, you challenge us, you reassure us, you draw us closer to you. Tonight, as we look at your word, may our hearts be open to you. May our minds be fresh. Uh, and Lord, may you speak to us through what we uh, now study together. Father, come now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So folks, last time we finished off in Hebrews chapter 4, we were near the end of the chapter. So we've got a few verses to finish off there before we start to uh, consider chapter 5. So let me read from verse 13 to the end of Hebrews chapter 4, first of all. This is the New Living Translation. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do. Yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find a grace to help us when we need it most. Amen. You know, that, that last, the, the, the start of those verses, verse 13, it's at the end of a little block. If, if your Bible breaks it up into headings, um, chapter 4 started off with the, he, the, the heading, uh, promise rest for God's people or something along those lines. And, and right at the end of that, we have this verse. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. That one verse is very challenging to us. Um, maybe um, it does and maybe it should make us tremble in, in reverent fear. But just listen to it. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. God sees everything. We can't hide anything from him. So we shouldn't try. You know, we, we do try to hide things. We, we, we hide things from those who we love. We hide things from our families, from our friends. You know, things that maybe we're ashamed of, we're embarrassed about. You know, it's, it's a bit like you see somebody maybe who, maybe the hair dye goes wrong. They put a hat on to try and hide the colour of their hair. Maybe they've got something with their skin and, and they grow their hair down to try and hide it. And we wear clothing to try and hide our bodies at times. You know, we, we, we're very good at trying to hide things. But nothing is hidden from God. And God sees not just the outside of us, but he sees the inside. He sees what's going on in our minds and our hearts. He sees it all. That's a challenge, isn't it? To realise that he knows us better than anybody else, better than ourselves. He says everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. Think of Adam and Eve. In the Garden of Eden, they were told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they did. And when they ate that and they realised that they were naked, they took fig leaves to try to cover themselves. And that's whenever God challenged them about what they had done. He already knew what they'd done. God knows everything. But he wanted to hear it from them. He challenged them, what, what have you done? And they tried to make up excuses, but they tried to cover themselves. So it's interesting that the translation puts it that everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. It takes us back to the start of time. Adam and Eve thought they could cover things up by wearing fig leaves and that would make things better. But it didn't. There was the breakdown in the relationship. God ended up making them clothing out of animal skins, which meant they had to kill an animal to do that. Uh, and, and there you have the first sacrifice as such. Uh, and maybe that's where they first learned to do this and to bring an offering to God. We just, we don't know that, we're not told that. But when here now, we are reading this verse that everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. It reminds us of that time. 
We can't hide anything from God. He sees it all. And more than that, the verse goes on to say, he is the one to whom we are accountable. Now, if you are a Christian, if you're a believer, if you follow Jesus, you know that we have God's grace through what Jesus has done. And we're going to come on to that. Um, But we still have to give an account of ourselves. And that's what that verse says. I mean, whoever the writer of this book is, he's writing to Christians. And, And the writer says, he is the one to whom we are accountable. So God does make us accountable for our actions. It's again nothing else. You can say sorry and you can be forgiven, but when you do something wrong, there's still a price to be paid. You're out in the car and you're caught speeding by the policeman uh, and you say sorry and you're genuinely sorry. That, that's fine. He'll accept your apology. But there's still a price that needs to be paid. You still have to give an account. Um, the price is gone, but the accountability is still there for us whenever we have our sins forgiven. Yes, Jesus pays the price. We're not judged on it. Um, God forgives us our sins, but one day we will give an account. Now, we don't know what that means exactly. Um, Will it be just a blink of an eye when we see our life flash before us and then God says, but you're my child? Or or what it'll be? Who knows? But it should make us stop and think because it should make us actually realise, well, look, if I'm going to give an account to God, I want to give a good account as far as I can. So if I know there's something in my life which is wrong, I can't hide it from God. It's already said everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. I can't hide it. So I come and I tell God about it. and I'm going to do my best to change that. I'm going to ask God to help me to change that part of my life so that when I give an account, I can say, look God, you taught me and I learned from that. And my life changed as a result of the work of your spirit in my life. Isn't that amazing to be able to do that? Amazing to be able to say that God changed my life. That's what we're meant to be. You know, the book of James is all about faith and works. Uh, But the whole crux of the matter is that we should have faith. We We need to have faith, first of all. But then how faith should change the working out of what we do in our lives. And because of faith, Our works should change. Our actions should change. And there's time and time again, that book has so much controversy around it. But it's about faith and how faith works its way out. And that's what this is about here. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. So realise that. God sees it. He's the one to whom we are accountable. So let's start to change. Let's start to allow God to change us for that accountability. This is why... Um, we have an accountability and not a judgment. So then, since we have a great high priest who's entered heaven, that, even that very word, great high priest, you know, high priests were the, the top priest in the temple. Uh, the, you, you had the tribe of Levi who were the priests uh, and who served, uh, and they all had different uh, jobs to do, and they took their turns at it. But you had the high priest who was above them all. It was the high priest who was responsible for looking after all the other priests. It was also the high priest who had to go into the the innermost part of the temple, the tabernacle, um, the Holy of Holies, every year to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the nation. A sacrifice to cover those sins which hadn't been confessed, those sins which hadn't already been covered with a blood sacrifice. He had that huge responsibility to be able to do that. And he had to enter into the inner sanctuary of the temple where the presence of God dwelt. Um, And he was only allowed to do it once a year. Now we have Jesus referred to as the great high priest who has entered heaven. So Jesus has gone into the ultimate place where God is, heaven. And he is the best of all high priests, the great high priest. And it said it's Jesus, the Son of God. So there's a declaration there made at the very start that Jesus is the Son of God. It takes us back to the beginning of Hebrews when the writer wants um, the reader to understand and, and make sure they're clear in their mind that they know who Jesus is. So he declares here, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? 
Do you believe that he is the great high priest? Do you believe that not only did he die for our sins, but that he rose again? And, and do you believe that as he is now actually in heaven? That, that's, you know, do, do you believe all of that? Um, you know, the writer wants us to understand this. He says, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings that we did, yet he did not sin. Jesus gave up the glory of heaven. Jesus took on the form of a man, uh, a human being, and came to earth. He was born as a baby. He grew up in a family. He learned a trade from his father, a carpenter. He also was about the temple, learning more about his heavenly father, about his real God, father, God. And then when the time was right, he listened to what God wanted him to do and he obeyed. So he understands what these bodies are like. He understands how they can be strong at times in our eyes, how they can be weak at times. He was also tempted and tested. Think about just after Jesus is baptised by John the Baptist. And Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan comes along to tempt him. Jesus is fasting. So he's struggling with the, the, the human hunger. He's, he's on his own, so he's coping with loneliness. And Satan comes along to tempt him. And yet Jesus doesn't give in. But that temptation is real. It's very real. But he doesn't sin. And that's what it says here. He faced all the same testings we do. Yet he did not sin. Yes, Jesus was the, is the perfect example for us. He's one person who never gives in to temptation. He never sins. But he understands what we are going through. That means that we have a God who understands us. A God who knows the troubles and the trials and the tribulations that we face day by day. He understands our frustration. He understands our anger. He understands our grief, our pain. And he walks through all of that with us. So often we feel at times that God is disconnected from us. We forget that through his son he experienced a lot. We forget that Jesus, whenever his friend died, wept. Jesus had that emotional outpouring. But then Jesus had the assurance of knowing what was going on. And we have that assurance too, if we read God's word and if we understand it. But we need to read it to understand it. We need to study it to be able to learn it. To realise that we have a great high priest who knows all this. So it goes on to say, let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God. That should give us confidence then to approach God. Boldly, boldness. It's not boldness in that you're, you're brash, but it's boldness in that there's confidence. We know we can approach the throne of God because of what Jesus has done for us. It says it's the throne of our gracious God. That's grace. And we have grace because of what Jesus has done. It says we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. God is not out to punish us unjustly. God is not out to put us down. God is not out to, to use us to beat around. God created us to be able to worship him and enjoy him, to enjoy being in his presence, to enjoy the wonder of what he has done. And that's what he wants. And he says, we will find grace to help us when we need it most. God's help is there. The barrier to that help a lot of the time is, is us. We blame God. We look for somebody else to blame. We know we don't reach out to God um, and ask him for that help whenever we need it. And he's standing there with his arms outstretched just saying, ask me, I'm here for you. Ask me and I will carry you. Ask me and I will help you through. I will give you the strength that you need. You know, elsewhere we're told that we'll never face anything that we cannot stand. There'll never be anything uh, that... God, there's not a way out of. And that's so true. Now, sometimes that way out is the ultimate um, healing, which is heaven. But there's always that. You know, so it's, it's, let's just reach out and grasp God by the hand. 
That leads us into chapter five. And, and you know, as, as you read through this, you're reminded of the fact that this is a letter uh, and that these chapter and verse markings are false as such because the heading that came at the beginning of verse 14 um, in the New Living Translation says, Christ is our high priest. And it rolls into chapter five. So this, this is a continuing um, story as we go into chapter five. So it says there to start, every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. That is why we must offer sacrifices. That is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sin as well as for theirs. And no one can become a high priest simply because he wants such an honour. He must be called by God for this work, just as Aaron was. That is why Christ did not honour himself by assuming he could become a high priest. No, he was chosen by God who said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. And in another passage God says to him, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent others. The high priest was chosen. The high priest was anointed and he was given that role that he would serve the people. And it was his responsibility to bring offerings and sacrifices for the people. Yes, other priests would have brought other sacrifices at times if they were on duty. But the high priest had the ultimate sacrifice of of the Holy of Holies every year. He had to bring that in and other times he would have brought special gifts and everything to to God in the temple on behalf of the people. That's why he says he presents our gifts to God and and sacrifices for their sins. That's what Jesus has done for us. He brought the ultimate sacrifice to God himself and, and sacrificed himself for our sins. It says about the high priest, he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. Again, it's showing us that Jesus can identify with us because he was in a human body and he had human desires and human weaknesses. It says that's why he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for theirs. Jesus didn't have to do that because he didn't sin. He was the one high priest who has never sinned. He never could sin because he, well, he could have, but he didn't because he is God's son. And you know, it's it's interesting since no one can become a high priest because he simply wants the honour. He has to be called by God. And and we forget that Christ was called by God and Christ was announced by God. You know, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, God several times says and declares to the people around him, this is my son, listen to him. This is, this is the one who I've chosen as the Messiah. And it, you've got that um, quote there in verse 5, which comes from Psalm 2, verse 7. You are my son, today I have become your father. And then another one um, in the next, it's, it's about from Melchizedek, which is Psalm 110, verse 4. You know, God declares Jesus to be his son. God says that he is our high priest. You're a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He, he was a king and a priest. You know, when you, next time we'll probably go into a bit more about um, Melchizedek and who he was. But he, he was both a king and a priest. And think about who Jesus is. Jesus is God's son. He's the heir to the throne. He is a king. But he is also our high priest. He is the one who intercedes for us. It talks about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for us. That means speaking on our behalf. That whenever we are accused, um, and whenever Satan comes and accuses us, oh, look at them, look at that person, look at what they've done. And they call themselves a Christian, how can they be? And Jesus says they're covered by my blood. He intercedes for us. He steps in and says to God, don't judge them because you can't because their sin has been forgiven. They have grace. They have your grace through my blood. So Jesus, again, is the ultimate high priest and king. There's nobody better than him. Nobody who understands us better than ourselves than him. Nobody who understands the struggles that we have. So 
Yeah, yeah, at the minute we're struggling. You know, so many people at this time are struggling. We're in lockdown. Um, we've got, you know, we, we're not in full lockdown. We can still go out and do a bit of shopping. We can still come to church on a Sunday and meet. Um, yes, other things have been restricted. Other things we can't do. Uh, and we do have to wear face masks when we go out. And, and, you know, we complain about that. And for a lot of people, that's a struggle. And for a lot of people, they're, they're mentally, they're having a hard time with this. Jesus understands that. And he understands that loneliness. Imagine how lonely Jesus must have felt at times and whenever he lived on this earth, when nobody understood who he was or what he was called to do. And Jesus carried the weight of that on his own shoulders. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the burden of that? It must have been immense. So yeah, he understands whenever we go through mental illness and whenever we, we struggle with what's going on around us, he, he understands that. If we're ill and we have pain, look at the pain that he suffered. Look at how his body was broken. You know, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was flogged. All for us. If we don't have much, look at what Jesus was like in his time. Whenever, whenever he travelled around, he said he didn't have anywhere to lay his head in. He didn't have a home. He talked about how the foxes have a home and how he didn't. He had nothing that was his own. He lived by faith. You know, Jesus' life is a huge challenge to us. But it should also be a huge encouragement. Because he understands what we are going through. You know, we talk about having empathy with one another or sympathising with one another. Or, you know, people say, I, I, I know how you feel. And I quite often say to folks, you know, I don't know exactly how you're feeling. But I can sympathise, I can identify because of similar experiences that I've had. I've had. None of us know exactly how we're feeling. Jesus does. Jesus knows exactly how you're feeling. And God knows exactly how you're feeling. It's not hidden from him. He sees it all. So you know what? Pour it out to him. Just, just, just lay it all out to him and tell him exactly how you're feeling. Tell him what's troubling you. Tell him what's pulling you down. Tell him what's encouraging you. Ask him to, if it be his will, to remove those things that are pulling you down and to increase those things which are drawing you closer to him so that you have that encouragement. Ask him for the strength that you need this day and every day and he will give it to you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you understand us. Thank you that your son Jesus is the great high priest who understands us so well. Lord, nothing is hidden from you. So right now we hand it all over to you and ask that you take these worries, these troubles, and that you deal with them. Father, give us the strength that we need day by day to live for you. And thank you that you do understand. Go with us now, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining with me again. It's been lovely having you here as we've done this. Uh, I'll see you again um, next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, take care. God bless. Please take the time to read over what we've done so far in Hebrews. Take the time to read over um, the next part of chapter five as well. And if you have any questions, please feel free to either give me a call, send me an email or text, or, uh, and just, just give me your questions, and I'll come back to you individually and answer those questions. Uh, but let's continue to pray that God's word would challenge us and uphold us and draw us closer to him. Take care. God bless. Bye.